All right, I'm here from Vinay Gupta. I think I'll just let you start wherever, man. So, yeah, I mean, you know, here I am. Uh, I am a 49. Uh, I turned 49 this year. Uh, I run a tech company, which is now four years old. We just launched our first product. Mm. Uh, I'm sitting in the middle of a gigantic boom in exactly my area of tech. So we've gone from kind of, you know, marching through the marshes with our welly boots on, wondering whether it was ever going to turn into something, to suddenly being like, oh my God, who just called? Um, uh, And yeah, it's all a little disorienting. It's like, Mm. you know, you get used to things being very hard and very slow, and then suddenly they're very fast and very unpredictable. Yeah, you're at the uh, overnight success point of Facebook, right? Um, well, I mean, our corner of the world is, right? The NFT thing has suddenly become the great global focus. And then within that, we've got this kind of physical NFT thing of like, NFTs for physical stuff? And people are still a bit like, you what? What do you mean physical stuff? Are you sure? So I wouldn't say we're quite at the overnight success part. I think it's going to be probably three months before there is a sudden realization of like, Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a generalized trade instrument. This isn't just crypto kitties. This is this is like a thing. So yeah, I think we're I think we're a little bit out from the point where people are like, oh, but yeah, I mean we're here we are. Mm. So like you you obviously like had something of a life before you got into this whole blockchain space. Um could you tell us a little about that? Sure. So my first year being paid 100% in anonymous digital cash was 1999. This is my yeah. third wave, possibly my fourth <laughs> wave. Uh, I was a cypherpunk back in the 1990s. I was writing mm. software to uh, basically do, you know, kind of private communication for yep. human rights groups. Uh, then I was part of the Eagle ecosystem. Um, uh, then I did a bit of time in the defense world. Mm. Uh, and then uh, I walked across the um, aisle and joined the Materium team in 2014. Sorry, mm. the Ethereum team in 2014. Yep, yep. Um, Materium was a little later. Yeah. Um, so could you actually, uh, could you explain what Ethereum is? Because like my audience, I assume, is pretty tech savvy, but I'm sure there's some people out there who don't know what it is. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, to be honest, even people that know think they know what Ethereum is do not know what Ethereum is. Uh, okay, cool. Right? It's like quantum physics. No, no. It's <laughs> it's just everybody has gotten the wrong end of the stick on blockchain because the currencies have confused them. Right. Right. Um, the reason the blockchain exists is because the speed of light is slow. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, how often do you hear the speed of light brought up in terms of reasons why the blockchain is a thing? Um pretty infrequently and i run in circles that like would bring that sort of thing up so go on the only reason the blockchain is relevant technology globally is because it's it's one of two or three known solutions for dealing with the fact that the speed of light is slow and trade is global Mm. now what do i mean by slow right um a high frequency trading system will do on the order of 10 million transactions a second uh running at peak Mm. right that's not a large number i mean you know if you have a computer which is clocked at four gigahertz that's four billion events a second Mm. so the idea that a ship a chip which is doing four billion events a second could be clearing 10 million transactions you know okay you're not doing that on one computer but these numbers are not wildly far from you see what i'm saying um now the flip side of that is that to get a message from you know, London to Australia and back takes about a seventh of a second, mm. assuming that everything is working perfectly. Yep, yep. Right? And that's a hard physical limit because the speed yep. of light is 300,000 kilometers a second and the mm. world is something like 24,000 kilometers around. So at that point, there's just an inevitable lag, seventh mm. of a second. Go back to a high-frequency trading system. It's going to do a million transactions in the length of time that it takes the signal to go to Australia and back. So there's a million transaction synchronization lag, inevitably on anything that involves doing high-frequency trading with with computers in a global context. Mm. Right? And that's a physics limit. There's no way around this. So 
the way that we solve this problem right now is that we cram all the computers running the algorithms for HFT into a mm. single building, and then they measure the Ethernet cables <laughs> down to the closest, right? Down to the closest <laughs> millimeter yep. to try and minimize the time differential that you get from having a shorter cable. Yep. Now, in that world, right, you can either have everything traded HFT style. Or if you want people to not trade at disadvantage based on their geography, you have to find another architecture. Yep. And the only other architecture we have that allows people to trade without a differential based on their geography is our good friend, the blockchain. Mm. Yep. And the reason for that is that a block is just a lump of quantized time. Mm. Right. Rather than running time as if it was continuous, where every second counts, we yep. divide time into a 10-minute block or a 15-second block, and yep. we say, relative to the operation of the blockchain, everything in this block happens at the same time. Yep, yep. And the block is large, the light speed delay is small, mm. and the result wipes out the advantage based on geography, which allows yep. us to do globally synchronized trade without your position on the Earth giving you an advantage on the Internet. Yep. That's why the blockchain matters, right? Mm -hmm. All of this stuff about independence from governments and this, that, and the next thing, all of that is basically nonsense. All right. And, you know, that's just kind of where it goes, right? I mean, it's just, we just have to deal with that. None of okay. that stuff is actually that fundamentally significant or even fundamentally true. You know, if the governments of the world decide they've had enough of Bitcoin, it's not going to take them that long. Oh, yeah, to yeah. Grind it down. Right. Yeah. Grind it yeah, down no. to the point with the kind of. Right? Yes. You know, Who has I mean, the most powerful like computers on Earth? The NSA. <laughs> right. And, you know, and I'm not saying that they could necessarily kill it, but they could certainly knock it well down. All right. So basically, it's like a way to create like, well, like a more even playing field. Because like I know that um. Oh, I can't remember who I heard it from, but I know that like apparently like New York, the city is like apparently looking more and more like a circuit board from above because, you know, the architecture of a circuit board is structured in such a way to like minimize uh, the time that like the electrons moving through it, doing the actual calculations on the actual material. Um so, you know, you can make that efficient and then you're seeing that in like, you know, the actual physical space because people are also trying to minimize the time because like it matters so much in high frequency trading. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, you see these same things in nature, like tree structures, mm, why do rivers yeah. and trees, right? you know, the answer is it just turns out to be that that's what water does. Yeah. Or that's what trees want water to do. Yep. It just takes on a different, it just takes on a similar structure. Yeah, yeah. There's a really cool um thing where like they got um a bunch of Japanese scientists got like some slime mold and they put it in like a space that resembled I think the like Tokyo City no the like Tokyo City and like various population hubs, uh and then like they let it grow and it like you know created like this optimal uh network. Um, that you know could have been used as like the subway infrastructure or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but yeah, there's like there's like some really cool like convergent evolution stuff uh, happening that you can see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, the same the same forces will make things roughly the same shape. Mm. You know, all wings are sort of alike. You know, mm. all fins are sort of alike. All feet are sort of alike. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, there's this thing where crabs apparently have independently evolved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's some really funny memes based around that. Uh, yeah. All right. Cool. Well, now I know you what know, I'm going to use. This. You, uh, yeah. Sorry. Go on. Yeah. It, it just you know it just gives you a sense of like the selective pressure to make things crab-like is very strong. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what is what what do crabs have to do with the um like actually what what. So what might the consequence be if, like, we, you know, we figure this stuff out um, and we actually do, like, uh, we, we, we institute, like, a blockchain and then, you know, people actually start using it as opposed to the standard high-frequency trading? Like, what, what might the consequences of that be? So the main thing that the blockchain gives you is a single shared global database of property mm. rights. Mm. 
right? And this is exactly the kind of architecture that you want for dealing with carbon. Yeah. Right? Single global yep. shared database, single global shared problem, right? Yep. There ought to be some way of doing global tracking of who's emitting the carbon and how much they're emitting so mm. that we know that collectively as species, we're not emitting too much. Mm. Right. If only there was some kind of technology that might actually address this problem. Well, I mean, if you were going to build that, you know, because it's global, nobody is going to trust any individual government to run that yep. database. Yep. They're definitely not going to trust an individual company to run that database. Mm. So, you know, global problem, you're going to need some kind of massive, you know, global map of who's emitting what. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you're going to track, like, you are driving down the street and it's looking yeah, at yeah, all yeah. this stuff to a global database. It's more that you would be tracking this at the level of, yeah. you know, here are the 50 big carbon emitters in your country and these are yeah, the yeah, mines yeah. that are actually yep. extraction. Yep. Um, because it doesn't matter what kind of political situation you have. Yeah. I, I remember uh, like a Vox article on um, how people were using satellites and machine learning to like track... Um, like fairly accurately like coal consumption um across the world mm -hmm. and i feel like you know the big centralized like you know uh power stations mines um oil refineries etc like those are very legible uh from you know that sort of perspective and so you know mm -hmm. like obviously obviously you can't track like everything but I feel like, you know, if you can just get, like, the really big things, uh, you can get a lot done with that. Um, and then, you know, the little stuff like, you know, maybe, I don't know, like, I'm sure you have thoughts on this. <laughs> You've been working in this problem space for much longer than I have. Yeah, I mean, if you get the big stuff right, the small stuff is pretty much irrelevant, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, like, that's the that's the fundamental situation. It's all kind of Pareto principle. Mm, um, yeah. And you know that is the um, I mean that's the crux of it, right? There's just there's just a very strong limit to how much carbon you know small farmers are able to emit. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. Up. And, um, and you know, like that thing with the you know twelve ships or something that emit as much carbon as two hundred million cars or something along these lines. You've seen that story. Uh, like, yeah, I think so. Um, you know. There just aren't that many gigantic emitters in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. you know, the critical thing is, like, think of a power grid. It's got a few gigantic emitters, which are the power stations. Mm. And then those go down onto an even fewer number of actual creation sites where you've got people doing things like mining the coal. Yeah, yeah. As so, like, as an Australian with, like, my government is um, really fucking shitty about this. There was, like, you know, some recent news stories about, like, how, you know, clean energy task force or something you know like they had like like people in the coal industry being appointed to them it's like completely insane um so yes i am very aware of like just how you know how how when you get down to it like the number is relatively small compared to like you know it like it like starts in these very small places and it like disperses out across the world um exactly. yeah, what it's like a, it's like the hub and spoke model. I think it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tree structured, right? You know, mm. you've got a big trunk in the middle, which is the main carbon economy, mm. and then it fans out into an essentially infinite number of leaves when you get things like cars. Yeah, yeah. Um, and <clears throat> you know that the simplicity of that model, right? Mm. It's not that hard to do yep. things like carbon tracking if we wanted to. Yep. You know, hey, how much coal did you pull out of the ground last night? Well, here's our number. How do we know the number's accurate? Because that's the number they're paying taxes on. You know, so at that point, what does that tell you about the global carbon management situation? I mean, it it tells you that, like, if, like, you wanted to make change, there's only, like, like the, the, the number of entities you need to put pressure on is relatively few, right? Well, I mean, if you saw away at the trunk, it's going to affect all the branches and all the leaves. Yes, yes, yes. But if you just, yes. Want, if you just want to count what's happening, that's a relatively yeah. small number of things. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And yeah. right now, we're not even doing the counting. Okay, yeah, that yes, make that makes sense. We're not at the point where like soaring off the trunk is preferable to like 
the alternative. And that's terror. Well, getting to that point would be terrifying. But we're not, I mean, we're not even tracking the stuff in any yes. kind of sensible looking way. Yes. Right? Yep. I mean, you know, we've got a, a truly gigantic, um, you know, global problem here. Mm. There are probably no more than a thousand companies that have substantial primary carbon capture capability. Mm. You know, there's no real attempt by government to get these companies, you know, clearly mapped and to do the horse trading. Mm. You know, it, it's a political problem. Yep. It's yep. not really even a technical or economic problem. It's a political problem. Yeah. So, yes, it is a political problem. And it, you know, it is the mother of all, like, tragedy of the commons plus, like, uh, what, what, what is it? Like, hyperbolic discounting uh, where, like, you know, the consequences are unevenly spread uh, the benefits are concentrated and like the time between like, you know, the bad act and the consequences is long. And it's also really difficult to like precisely trace cause and effect because it's so fucking complex. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Nightmarishly difficult thing to get action on as we're finding out. Yes. I am of the opinion that um like the uh the good people who like got solar subsidies and like brought down the cost uh uh and i i you know i am politically an anarchist but you know the people who made that happen in government i will happily tip my hat to them because um like i really do think that you know the primary way we're getting out of this is just like really just like, you know, on the edges, we have to bring this stuff down in cost and like any method that does that I think is good. And there are, there are like a lot of, you know, perverse incentives Mm. and stuff at play, but the consequences are so like utterly terrifying that like you have to bite bullets sometimes yeah i mean i I saw something recently that said that um lithium-ion batteries Mm. were 50 times cheaper now yes than they were uh, solar panels yeah no that that is like sorry go on well i mean you know it's pretty clear that the problem is not going to get solved other than through the thing which is getting 50 times cheaper in 30 years continuing to get cheaper until the point where it's cheaper than everything else and then you get yes yes and I, I think you know? I think the primary role that you know people who really give a shit like have to play because uh, I know, I know like you know you um, you've talked a lot about like the inadequacy of like the sort of model from the '60s where you know everyone becomes enlightened and then we you know all like rationally move towards a better better world. Uh, I also think that's like kind of bullshit. I think I think like the role mm-hmm. that you know people who like really give a shit about this it's to like you know just just get in the fucking trenches because like you know you are intrinsically motivated and therefore can endure more than like people who aren't it's like your job is to just like drag you know the solutions um and like willingly accept a a lower quality of life and all the difficulty that comes with that and just like you know like drag us to the point where like what like the prisoner's dilemma dynamics uh no longer make sense and then suddenly you know like governments around the world suddenly like wake up and they go oh that the the money that the fossil fuel lobby gives us uh is is clearly outweighed by the fact that you know like our entire business community would really like cheaper cheaper energy or like you know we can get like cleaner air and you know like there's all these benefits from that uh without you know losing out in other ways and i i I really think that that's the way um and you know it's not it's not like sexy um but like fuck it (laughs) you know if if you look at the history of social change like it it kind of always was like that so you know yeah i mean I i think that's a pretty reasonable read um you know, the whole sort of mass awakening thing, like, 
if everybody that was interested in mass awakening was doing mm. an hour of either tai chi or hatha yoga a day or some equivalent discipline mm. and an hour of meditation <laughs> and was getting regular therapy i would oh, take yeah. the story of mass awakening a lot more seriously yeah. right i mean you know i i have yep. done a lot of spiritual work in my time and the levels of effort required are you know an hour or two a day sustained over a decade mm. to make any kind of really substantial progress for most people not for everybody but for most people and you know, if all the people who are just like, oh, Mass Awakening, Age of Aquarius, you know, the, the cosmic opera, you know, grand coordinate, whatever the term of the day happens to be, right? The people who think that it's going to be a consciousness-led solution, if I saw everybody who has their jaw hanging open about that actually putting in a couple of hours a day to make it happen for them individually, then, yep. you know, a few hundred thousand people at that kind yeah, of level yeah. of effort, you would begin to see some things happening. But, you know, how many people are actually putting in that kind yeah. of effort yeah. on these I mean, like, yeah. I mean, like, I, I certainly don't. Like, I, like, I fucking... Right? And maybe it's maybe it's just because, you know, like, my body isn't, like, strong enough. You, but, like, I, like, I'm, like, 10 minutes of meditation and then, like, holy fucking shit. Like, I just sure. can't go any further. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't think, like, I don't think I need, uh -huh. you know, to, like, put in that much work well no yeah. there are many mechanisms for changing things right I mean, the, the world is filled yeah. with different strategies that people can use to change the world but you know the, the thing that i'm trying to get to here is like mm. it's not yeah. that mass awakening yep. isn't a strategy right mass awakening is a strategy but for that strategy to be executed successfully you have to have yep. a mass yep. that is doing the work of awakening right you know, it's like, well, you know, our pitch is masked battle. And how many people turned up to your masked battle? Well, four or five yep. people. And all they brought were dustbin lids and broom hands. Yes. This is not going to go very well. So, you know, it's not that I disagree with the notion of spiritual awakening. Obviously, I don't. But when we talk about spiritual awakening as a solution to spiritual problem, mm. uh, to, to political problems, right? Spiritual awakening is going to solve political problems. How many people have to be doing the work of waking yeah. up? before they're a meaningful political force. It's minimally hundreds of thousands. And I mean, in terms of people sustaining an hour a day practice for multiple years, other than the people that are doing that from the stuff that I've taught over the years, Jeez, that's... I've met maybe three or four. You know? Yep. Because at the end of the day, very few of the people that are teaching are teaching with a serious intention yep. that the people that they're teaching are actually going to wake the fuck up. Right? mostly what they're teaching is the stuff that they could teach mm. without anybody having a hard time and you know it turns out that the path to awakening is very hard and if you're going to be doing that you mm. are going to have yep. a hard time definitionally right yep definitionally this is a hard process um i mean okay, you've, yeah, you've always got exceptions you've romana maharishis and so on but you know um, for the vast majority of people they're going to get mm. there by hard work if they're going to get there at all and I just don't see civilizational engagement with that, even among the cultures that say they're they're dedicated to this kind of awakening. Right? Imagine Burning Man, right? You know, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. every morning at Burning Man, the entire goddamn camp is silent because everyone is meditating. Right? Well, how different an event is Burning Man if you have an hour of meditation baked into the schedule in the same way that you've got the burning yep. of the man and the temple baked into the schedule? How different is this, right? And, you know, it's, again, it's not that mm. I'm saying that's what Burning Man should be. What I'm saying is we know that these movements are not fundamentally spiritual movements because they don't fundamentally yep. have spiritual practices baked in at their core. And at that point, I think you could take those entire set of structures built around the dream of awakening and you could just ring fence it as, like, mm. never going to happen. They just don't have the manpower. And then at that yep. point, you're back looking at yep. either politics or tech. All right. Well, politics, you know, democracy, like when we designed four-year <laughs> electoral democracy with, you know, paper ballots, people were still 
shitting in buckets and throwing out yep. windows as a normative yep. practice for urban sanitation. What were the, what were the literacy? Sorry, what were the literacy so rates why back would then? We expect a dem- I, I don't know off the top of my head, but they can't have been great. Oh, a great question. Not certainly. Not. Ah, yeah. Well, Although, on go. the other That's hand, we just didn't solution. let very many people vote. That was how they rolled in those days. So, you know, if we don't mm. if we don't upgrade the machinery of democracy to better implement the goals of democracy, mm. we should not be surprised if democracy is ineffective. You know, nothing else in our society has changed as little as the voting process in the last three or four centuries. Everything has been completely transformed. And yet we've still got mm. this kind of horse-drawn wagon approach to voting. And then we wonder why the politicians yep. don't seem to represent our interests yep. very efficiently. I mean, like, yeah, and this isn't a new problem. H- have you um have you heard of the Crisis of Democracy report? No. All right. Well, it's 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 worth reading the Wikipedia summary, but um, basically it was written in like the seventies, uh, basically after you know like the sixties happened in not just America but also Europe and Japan. And it's basically like a bunch of, you know, elite sociologists who are like all advisors to, you know, political types. Um, it's it's published. It was published by the Bilderberg Group. Um, I think actually it was one of like the first publications of it. But it, it's it's basic like argument was basically like uh, society is like becoming increasingly complex. Uh, citizen engagement in democracy is making it hard for the process to actually work. Uh, we're seeing like generalized mistrust. Um, all of these things are unsustainable, uh, especially with like you know the uh, geopolitical sort of interests of um, like that the governments have. Uh, something needs to be done. Uh, we should actually make society less democratic. Um, I, I I know that um, Noam, Choms- Noam Chomsky really like, really like citing it. Well, I mean, if that was the objective, I would say they've made fairly good progress. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, th- uh, no, but I, I actually think that I actually think that, like, from a purely like instrumental point of view, I think that it was actually quite rational. I think that having like an institution that governs millions of people and trying to like sort through like the millions of preferences that those people have. Uh, I, I think that, you know, just information, like information theoretically, like unless we develop tele- telepathy, um, I just like, I, I think that just like breaks. And I think like the only alternative, like the two, the two options like are either deadlock or like you basically have to retreat to like some sort of oligarchy uh, to run things. I don't think it's, I don't think it's that, that we're around at all. I don't, I mean, the problem that we have in the democracies is not problems finding consensus. The problem we have in the democracies right. is that we don't punish liars. Everybody has come to the conclusion that politicians lie. All politicians lie. Lying no longer harms or ends your career as a politician. So, you know, we're in a position where we've got a massive problem with the politicians saying one thing and then doing another. Um, but we don't punish them when they do that behavior. Mm-hmm. So they continue to do it because it works for them. And, you know, that's our fundamental problem is that we're governed by liars and thieves. It's not that the system of democracy is not working. It's that we haven't gotten into a situation where the voters are adequately right. punished people that lie to them. All right. And that's I mean, a cultural problem, right? You know, if any time a politician lies about something, yeah. you simply destroyed their career and moved on. I am very sorry. You were caught lying to the public about something substantial. We will never mm. vote for you again. Get off the fucking platform. If we had that kind of an approach, we would have an honest political class. I I will respectfully disagree with you. You don't think we'd have an honest political class if we did that? Um, I think, I mean, okay, yes, I think that if we if we manage to do that, I think that consequence would result. It's just that, well, okay, I think I think that if we did that, we would have a political class that was far more timid, and that would in terms of like decisions they would be a lot more conservative um just because i think that yes politicians do lie but there's also just like 
dynamics where you know you implement a change and then the consequences of that change you can't know in advance because again the system is too complex um there is an yeah. there is inherent predictability and risk in politics i would i would certainly like to live in a world where politicians are far more upfront about like risk and uncertainty uh i that yes i, I now agree with you <laughs> mm-hmm. Because, you know, we're going to do yep. well if our politicians are honest. And we're going to go bad. It's going to go badly if our yep. politicians are thieves. You know, what's the point of having a system where the public get to vote for people if those people are lying to the public about who they are yep. and what they're going to do? The public are voting for illusions. And that, as a fundamental approach, you know, this is we have a cultural problem, which is we do not mm-hmm. punish lying in politicians nearly severely enough. As a result, there's no real penalty for lying as a politician. As a result, lies dominate truth in political discourse. And it turns out that you can't make effective decisions if the that. information that you're working from is lies. And, you know, you wonder why democracy broke. Well, we broke the cycle of truth that was meant to be mm. at the heart of demo- uh, the democratic process. But the thing that blows my mind about this, right, the thing that fundamentally, you know, is just shocking to me is the degree to which the voters are directly responsible for their choice mm. to accept lying politicians to represent them. Right? Why are the voters accepting people that lie to them rather than insisting that the people that are going to be doing their political representation tell the truth? I think the answer to that is very complicated and there are probably entire books written on it that I haven't read and so I will decline to answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> About my pet theory is oh, yeah. that the truth is simply so horrifying and unacceptable um, that the voters... Right? Yeah. Uh, are you are you familiar with um, terror management theory? <laughs> no, I'm not. That sounds right up my street. What is... Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um... Yeah, no, you, you should you should check it out. You'd love it. Um, so, actually, I got into, like, philosophy through existentialism. Uh, and, like, the main existentialist book I read was um, this book called The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. Um, And his basic argument is that uh, culture is basically like a very convoluted way to cope with the fact that we we know that we will all die. And so we are rationally irrational when it comes to things that threaten our sense of self that we project beyond ourselves because that is the way that we achieve immortality because you know we might die but these like symbols or things that we leave on uh they secure a sort of immortality for us because they are like a way for our project to keep going and of course this has obvious implications for politics um like, you know, in like the olden days when you had like absolutist kings, like they in many ways represented like they, they were uh, in some polities, they were like, you know, the di- direct representative of God. Right. Um, mm. And then, yeah. you know, like democracies come along and like instead it's like the people. And of course, you know, like nationalism uh, was in many ways like a way to kind of get over this. Uh, was a way to like you know channel death anxiety because you know you had like this nation that you know had this history um and it like was this group of people who you know would work together to achieve certain things and then you know uh i guess and this i think like has gotten like very you know sort of confused uh since like the world war ii um because well like nuclear weapons have sort of stopped mass war um but you know like there's there's like other sort of like things that people identify with anyway um yeah (laughs) yeah that's interesting that's interesting so you know the sort of nation or you know as a super family Mm. you know well my genes will go on my nation will go on my culture will go on our people will go on very kind of volkish yeah yeah i mean that notion that we've got these kind of cultural blocks that are partly genetic guilds and partly epiphenomena makes a ton of sense right but the 
the question is still, why are these things universally so badly run? Mm. Like, for God's sake, why are we not making a go of, like, can you think of a single country that has a good government? Um, I think Taiwan and New Zealand, maybe. New Zealand's made a pretty good show of it recently, right? But wasn't there an enormous amount of structural corruption in their housing markets? <laughs> you know, massively high rent. Yeah, they weren't allowed yeah, to build yeah. anything new. It was, you know, slavery. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know, like, I think it's just very hard, right? Singapore under Lee Kuan Yew. Oh, uh, yeah. Fantastic economic performance, right? Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic economic performance, right? Socially, culturally, mm. open questions. There's certainly a lot of debate about that track record. So, you know, all the way through, I think we're in a position where the systems of government that we're using are very inefficient. Yep. And a huge part of that, you know, think of the American founding fathers, right? Mm. With a single stroke of the pen, all men are created equal, <laughs> you know, with certain inalienable rights endowed by their creator, right? At the same time as continuing the institution of slavery. Mm. Right? I mean, you know, ha- what was happening in their heads? I mean, you could assume that all men were equal except for the ones that we own. I mean, like, I, I'm pretty sure if you like, if you look into it, like there were like loopholes. Um, I, I think were re- I think were religious in nature. So like you know, mm-hmm. uh, these people don't actually count because you know they don't have God given rights because we you know found a loophole. Um, yeah, or they did right. You know, there's writing from that time with people pointing out exactly that. Oh yeah, right? you know, English critics of the American Revolution who are just like. It is funny how the Americans managed to do, you know, all this talking about, you know, yep. rights, inalienable rights, while maintaining slaves. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it and is also, that they can- and also like the Haitian Revolution that was like inspired by the French Revolution, and then gets put down by the French. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, right. So this kind of bone deep hypocrisy in politics and in power, yeah. and the fact that the population are willing to put up with that. I got to say, right, if you buy government from thieves and liars, don't be surprised when you get conned and defrauded. Yep. I I very much agree. So why is nobody for honest government? So I think the reason why is that, like, so, you know, obviously everyone's lives would be improved by having, like, better systems of governance. Uh, and I'm using that instead of government because I think there are, like, non-state ways or like alternative ways of resolving disputes. Um, but, you know, like the, the cost of getting to that point uh, is, is pretty tremendous. And if you want to see it, just like look at the history of, you know, revolutions or like major, you know, social battles to reform the system. Like they're all, you know, fairly costly. They all result in like unintended consequences. And so I think at the end of the day, it like actually is just a matter of sort of rational choice, uh, even if people don't like consciously, you know, realize it on the same level that I did. But you know, like, you know, you you could fight for change, but like, there's no reason you're going to see it. And you know, even if you're altruistic, uh, the chances that you'll succeed like are quite low. And so I think I think it's you know, like you're just kind of trapped. Yeah. Yes. I mean, so how do you think we could get out of this, right? I how what's the escape route from a culture of pervasive corruption? I I Jesus fucking Christ. Uh, oh man. That hey, is Okay, uh, uh, yeah. Um let me let me just, you know, like solve all of political philosophy over a um podcast interview. Easy, easy, no problem, no pressure. Well, I mean, all I'm saying is, like, how do we incentivize people yeah. to tell the truth to I each mean, other? Right? Or, to put it another way, stopping us telling the truth to each other. I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe blockchains have a role to play in it. I, I certainly don't think that going through like the current system right now... Wait, wait. Blockchain is that well-established place of truth and I mean, sincerity in all I don't know. <laughs> no, but I don't know. <laughs> Well, so I have I have a suggestion here, right? Which is this: people are lying to each other because 
society has made people being what they actually are completely unacceptable, right? Domain after domain after domain after domain, the sociological norm that people think they're supposed to behave like and that mm. other people think they're supposed to behave like turns out to be some total freaking fiction. Um, there's a lovely bit of research done 50-something hmm. years ago by the U.S. Air Force where they measured all of the you know pilots to try and figure out what the average pilot looked like so they mm -hmm. could make planes that fit the average pilot. And what they discovered was that if you took something mm -hmm. like 14 body measurements for people, only 3% of people were yep. average on all 14 body yep. measurements. Most people were average on most measurements, yep. but almost nobody was average yep. on all measurements. So if you think about you know, the 557 ways for mm. somebody to be a freak, most yep. people, if you look at them real close, are a yep. freak on one of those axes, right? A bunch of them are gay. A bunch of them are super introverted. A bunch of them are super extroverted. A bunch of them are sociopaths. A bunch of them are psychopaths. A bunch of them have major depressive incidents. A bunch of them yep. have schizoid tendencies, right? And, you know... What we don't have is very many yep. people yep, that yep, are yep, just yep, yep. normal people like the people that people think they're supposed to be, right? So we have an artificial restriction mm. on what constitutes normal people, um, and it's not that most people don't fit yep. into but that. They, but they, there's status, always an outlier, right? uh, a thing that they're an outlier yep. on, right? Right. And what we've learned to do as a culture, presumably because of our brutal, nasty, mm. evil, med medieval past, is people have gotten very mm. used to concealing those outliers. Right? And that culture where we basically think, hey, mm. this is normal, you're supposed to conform, and the fact that almost nobody does, it places us into a kind yep. of hypocrisy inside of our heads. And then everybody else is working around yep. the need to maintain yes. that illusion. I, and yep. this is a yep. bad freaking I, I actually, I, I agree with you on all that. Um, I think, though, it actually stems from the Industrial Revolution. Um, and I think I think especially what what like a culprit is, well, a major culprit, is the fact that uh, they tried to apply, like, methods of mass production that worked well for, you know, like, really simple things, like, I don't know, like, pins is the classic example, to, like, people. Um you know, mm -hmm. it was like the same sort of logic, and and in like a certain way, um, in a certain way, it makes sense because like you know you have massively expanding populations, you have like constant change in technology, you don't have the people to like you know give everyone like I don't know a holistic, classically liberal arts education or whatever. You just need to like you know get get the people with something so they don't like they can work the machines and you know maybe that maybe their kids will. Uh, have something better and so you know may maybe if it was like for a generation or two i could see the utilitarian calculus but like the fact it's continued for so long uh when we so like obviously have far more organic and dexterous ways of um like socializing people i guess um is, is like a is a true travesty mm -hmm. yeah 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 so i mean here I think that it's very, very important to think about the goals of the system, right? The goal of the system is... Oh, yeah, yep, Stafford Beer. Does, right? Stafford Beer, right? The goal of the system is what it does. Industrial mass production makes it very easy for big companies and big platforms yep. like churches and states to make bets about the future. Yep. It increases the predictability of society in a way that is optimal for people that are managing large amounts of resources yep. and throwing them into the future by force, right? It's just a thing that we do. So, you know, I think it's important for us to think of this in terms of if we've got better ways of doing modeling of risk, maybe that's what it takes for us to yep. accept the real complexity of society. Like, you know, if you think about how comfortable we are with the, un mm. the unpredictability of the weather – because we can now do a four-day forecast, yep. which is pretty damn accurate. At that point, for the most part, people have stopped mm. worrying about what the weather will be like. Right? You get the four-day forecast. You look at the day that you're going to do the thing you want to do. You take the umbrella or not, or the coat or not, depending on what the weather will be like. And it's accurate so mm. much of the time that you're not really fussed. 
pretty straightforward. So I think that maybe if we were better at predicting and we were better at operating around those predictions, you know, are we going to invest in a new transit line or not, right? Maybe if we were much better at managing the risk and uncertainty around these things and much better at predicting transport load, maybe we would be less disciplinarian about the need for the population to mm. all behave the way that we expect them to behave. Yeah. Because I think an enormous yeah. is driven by uncertainty reduction yeah. in yes. large scale yes. investment. Yeah. Like if we think about what's the economic basis for wanting a society which is predictable, a lot of that is about the ability to plan for the future yep. knowing kind of sort of what people want. And that applies at all levels of society. It applies to governments, it applies to this, it applies to that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think there's something to be said. Uh, and I, I, I think you've written on this. There's like, if you have like, you know, more locally responsive infrastructure, you can, you know, I, I, oh, yeah. this is like a general principle, I think. It's like, you know, you have like mass cohesion and then you can, you know, you can achieve like uh, economies of scale or, or like coordinated action at scale uh, or you can have like more decentralized, uh, not as cohesive, but it can have like more iteration, more autonomy at the micro scale. And I, I, I think that I think trade offs between the two, mm-hmm. especially in light of and <laughs> I originally contacted you after the um, the the blizzard in Texas that you know shut everything down. Um, I think that, you know, oh, yeah. in anticipation of events like that being not, you know, freak, but in fact, actually becoming quite normal. Uh, I think, I think those sort of trade-offs, uh, especially worth considering. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. I mean, this, this all boils down to how do we live in a more unpredictable world? You know, technological unpredictability, social unpredictability is certainly increasing. Like, did anybody imagine that young people were basically going to have like a third less sex than their yep. grandparents' generation did? You yes. Know, what happened there? Uh, well, something. You know, the numbers speak for themselves. Things are yeah. very, very unusual. So, you know, unpredictable social changes of kind which just yep. bend you into a completely different format. You know, that is the norm. That is how society works, is it moves in ways that we think are impossible until it happens, and then you turn around and go, mm. what the heck was that? And then another one comes. So maybe in the face of that, it's not that surprising that the governments are frantically yep. scrambling for certainty all the time, um, and that they push that desire yep. right through the education system and so on. But, you know, the only way that we're going to get through this is by having populations yep. which are much better at dealing with uncertainty, and that doesn't mean making people precarious it means making yes es- especially especially in the age where like you know if you want like if you want to like work a predictable environment uh artificial intelligence is quickly becoming superior yeah absolutely absolutely um so yeah i mean i guess yeah know, yeah that's pretty much where we have to leave it right we're in a position if we want the world to work better, we need governments that are more accepting of the extreme yep. variability of their populations, not only within generations, but between generations. And, you know, it's not a bad fit for an extremely variable, unpredictable yep. world. And, and probably, and we're probably going to get some other, like, weird stuff, like, that will be of concern in, like, a decade or two that will add to that list. I, you know, biotech for sure. Also, I'm waiting for the aliens to show up. You know, I mean, oh, dude, I'm I'm so I'm so excited. Uh, I, 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 sorry, one last thing before I leave you. Oh, are you aware of Posadism? Yeah. <laughs> Space <laughs> communism. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Yep. All right. I, I, well, excellent. Really good talking. I think I I think I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you so much. This has been great. <laughs>